This is our, I'm ready. our weekly Bible study in the Gospel of Matthew, and we're focusing tonight not on Matthew, but on uh, the revelation of God and God's involvement in the coronavirus pandemic. So why don't we open in prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the technology that, that has become available to us that allows us, even though we're now separated and isolated and apart from one another, but nevertheless allows us to be in touch with one another, to reach out, to continue to share our faith, to continue to share our thoughts and our, our ideas, and to continue to grow in our faith and our knowledge of you and our love of you. We pray, Lord God, that this evening we, we, we learn more about you, Lord God, and that in the process of this evening's study that we grow closer to you and that also that we, we in our own minds, dispel the myths that abound uh, about you and, and in the process begin to see you as you really are. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Father, Amen. Amen. And of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So let me begin by reading the, uh, the post. It says, in three short months, just like he did with the plague of Egypt, God has taken away everything we worship. God said, you want to worship athletes? I will shut down the stadiums. You want to worship musicians? I will shut down civic centers. You want to worship actors? I will shut down theaters. You want to worship money? I will shut down the economy and collapse the stock market. You don't want to go to church and worship me? I will make it where you can't go to church. If my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, that I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So the last part is a quotation from uh, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. So this is to be uh, objected to on uh, hermeneutical grounds, which is to say on, on the basis of the Bible itself, on theological grounds and on historical grounds. So let's begin with uh, the biblical basis and the hermeneutical grounds. What do you think about this, particularly about the quotation that justifies all of this and the view that God is active in the coronavirus? Any thoughts? Where did the quotation come from? I don't remember Second. those. Well, just the very last part. Where did the rest of it come from? It comes from uh, Solomon's dedication of the temple. So that's a good place to start. Why don't we look at the quotation? What so was the chapter? Sorry. Just second. Hi, Barbara. It's Hi. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Verse 14. This is really a favorite of, of everyone who believes that God is punishing and eager for judgment and just can't wait to inflict punishment and suffering on us. So let's start at uh, chapter, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 11. Um, and let's read to the end of the chapter. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself 
as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you, if you walk before me, as David your father walked, doing according to all that I have commanded you, and keeping my statutes and my ordinances, then I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David your father, saying, There shall not fail you a man to rule Israel. But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from the land which I have given you in this house, which I have consecrated for my name. I will cast out of my sight, and I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And at this house, which is exalted, everyone passing will be astonished, and say, why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will say, because they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this evil upon them. So... Mm -hmm. There's a, so any thoughts? So there's a broader context here. First, the, uh, the building of the temple. Remember we, we read, um, of David's desire to build a temple when we were uh, discussing Jesus' ministry and especially the suffering servant and, and the passion that one of the tasks of the Messiah was to, uh -huh. to build a new temple. And in fact, the Messiah, Jesus, is himself the new temple. So uh, go back to... Uh, Second Samuel, uh, chapter seven, verses one through 16. Now when the king dwelt in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies round about, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. So Nathan is a bit presumptuous, and then he gets corrected by God. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord. Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I've been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. 
and I will make for you a great name like the name of all the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. You shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. We can, we can stop there. So David's uh -huh. desire for a temple is fulfilled in, in Solomon, but it's also later fulfilled for all time. That temple was destroyed in the Babylonian invasion. It was then rebuilt and vastly remodeled under Herod, and then it was finally destroyed. Uh, that second temple was destroyed in 70 in the, the uh, uh, Jewish-Roman War and, and the conquest of, of Jerusalem by General Titus. So uh, the prophecy looks forward to, uh, after David's death, to Solomon's building and dedicating the temple, which is the verse we read, <coughs> and further looks forward to Jesus as, as the son of David uh -huh. and as the, the permanent temple. So Jesus becomes the fulfillment of that prophecy. But there's also... You notice in in, in second uh, second chronicles there's the um, the curse that starting in verse nineteen. But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes, my commandments, you now that that uh, that really is a follow on from uh, verse fourteen, which is the basis of this this. Uh, uh, so-called prophecy about God's involvement in, in the coronavirus. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, etc. So the point here is that God is traveling in the Ark of the Covenant with his people and He's found in a moving tabernacle. God has not desired a temple or a permanent place of dwelling. He's also experienced the infidelity of the Israelites, all of the grumbling, all of the complaining that they really should would have been better off as slaves in Egypt, the, uh, the catastrophe of the golden calf, um, the constant... Um, looking after other gods and the constant dissatisfaction with what God has done. And so there are blessings and curses. We've looked at those in the past, but they're found uh -huh. in, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28. I don't want to spend a great deal of time on it since uh, it's long, Let's just turn to Deuteronomy uh -huh. uh, chapter 28 and, and read a few of the blessings and then go on to some of the curses just to get a sense of, of what the blessings and the curses are about. Did you just say Deuteronomy 8? Chapter 28. Chapter 28, 28. Thank you. verse 1. And if you obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I command you this day, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. 
and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, and the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your beasts, the increase of your cattle, and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading dough, trout. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. Then the curses begin in verse 15. So these are what happens if you don't obey the covenant. But if you'll not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading trout. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the fruit of your ground, the increase of your cattle and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. Then it goes on with pestilence, with being eaten by animals, with, with all sorts of horrible things. So this is the old covenant uh, promise for fidelity and the punishment for infidelity. So what then does this apply to? You notice that, that the verse in, in Deuteronomy says, and God will heal your land, right? So that's a really, really important, God will heal the land. So that's typically interpreted by uh, those who oppose the, or support this view of God as, as uh, punishing that God, if we turn to God and repent as a nation, that God will heal our nation. So the word is land, translated as land is in English. Sometimes it's translated as nation in English or in earth in English, but in the Septuagint in Greek, the word is ge. World. I'm sorry, what, Mary? I just said it means world, not us, the USA. Well, actually, it means, no, it doesn't. It means less than that. So there are three words in Greek that are important, that are not interchangeable, and that are frequently confused. The first word is cosmos, and cosmos means, the cosmos means the entire world, everything. That's uh -huh. not used here. The second word is akumenie, and akumenie means the entire civilized world. So in Jesus' time, the entire Greek-speaking world is akumenie. The boundaries of the Roman Empire form the, the boundaries of civilization. Outside of the boundaries of the Roman Empire is uncivilized territory. So that civilized world is akumenie. And then the final word is gi. Gi is the promised land. Gi is the land promised to God's people, to the Israelites. And so this is really not a blanket thing about God's healing uh, anything. This is about God's healing gi, the promised land. So this is really a conditional promise to the Israelites. So on hermeneutical grounds, one would have to argue that it, it doesn't apply. We see the same confusion in with Guy if we read uh, St. John's Revelation, where uh, there are all of these evidently horrible prophecies that are going to inflict the entire world and and uh, you know we're all going to suffer and it's going to be 
very miserable for us and, and it'll be horrible and isn't this awful. But, but John always uses the word ye and he does because this, the, the book of Revelation until the final chapters is primarily a, a prophecy about the near future after John's vision. That prophecy was fulfilled by the destruction of the temple in 70, and that prophecy was about Gi, the promised land. It was about the destruction of the temple. It was about the destruction of the temple system. It was about the passing of, uh, of an old order and the establishment of a new order in the form of the church. So uh, that's really critically important. So basically, this entire quotation is taken completely out of context and used really completely outside of the Christian tradition for purposes that are, I think, decidedly anti-Christian. So thoughts about that, comments, discussion? Well, in the Christian tradition, God is not a vengeful God. Right. Right. So that's the second issue. Those words? I'm sorry, what, Colin? How do you spell those words? Gi and Acumenian? Um, cosmos is K-O-S-M-O-S. Akumeni is O I K O U M E N E, and G is G E. So, Ron, if the promise, if the prophecy is about the promised land, like the one that was included in the text, was also like referring to a near future, like was in Revelation, or no? Um, well, you mean in terms of Second Chronicles and, and the... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in the, you know, if we look at the old... Old Testament prophecy, in many ways, the point of Old, the Old Testament prophecy always offers you know, the carrot and the stick. So if you <laughs> are faithful to the Lord God, then you'll be rewarded in various ways. And so we see that in the blessings and the beginning of Deuteronomy chapter eight, you'll be blessed if you're faithful, if you obey the covenants, if you obey the commandments of God, you'll be blessed by you know going in and going out. If uh, if you don't, and then there's the stick. If you aren't faithful to the covenant, if you don't keep God's commandments, you'll be punished. You'll be eaten by animals. Birds will prey on you. There'll be you know, what, what, what's described in the book of Revelation as the feast of the fowl, uh, bad things will happen to you. So, so in many ways, the, the point of Old Testament prophecy is to, to pr provide a stark choice. You can choose God and the rewards, or you can choose to not follow God, and in that case, you reap the punishment. Um, So, um, does does that answer your question, Thais? Mm -hmm. So it's yeah okay. So in some sense, it's less. I mean, we we tend to think of a prophecy as as a, a hard prediction about what's going to mm -hmm. happen, but but Old Testament prophecy really isn't so much about prediction of what's going to happen, 
Although, you know, the problem is that in some sense it does happen when you abandon God. But, but it's really uh, an attempt to give you, a ch to present before you choices and con the probable consequences of your behavior that leads you to choose between them. And so that's okay. what, what this really is. And, and it applies, and the important thing is that it applies to the promised land. It's not this blanket thing about God healing stuff. I see, I see. So any other comments? Before we... Did Derek make it on he sent a text saying that he's on saying that he okay yeah, he's, good. he's here okay i good. misread your your um text i read it as 8 7 30 to 8 30 and then 8 30 to 9 20. Yeah, we, we so i didn't think we were call. coming in at seven we we can stay on this call we're not being we're right not but being i didn't come in at seven because i thought it was going to start at 7 30. Um, I, I was uh, wrong. Yeah, well, we won't be interrupted, so we can okay. continue on on this call okay. for the entire time. I'll mute out again. Uh, so, incidentally, just so that you know, Derek, we're discussing Second uh, Chronicles chapter seven, verse fourteen, and the view that God has inflicted the coronavirus on us as punishment for. Um, for our infidelity, for you know all sorts of things. But so, didn't Father Vu call it the uh, angel of death during his sermon? When was that? Um, oh, it was last Sunday. Sunday. Last Sunday. I don't remember actually. Yeah, my um. My daughter called me up all upset about it because we, we sent her the connection to the mass. Uh -huh. She was sitting and she said, Dad, why would he made me, he made, he frightened me even more. <laughs> I said, oh, that, that, you know, the Corona, the death part is, could, could be something like what you just said. Uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think Father meant it. Terribly, literally. Wait, well, you got to understand she's a hypochondriac, yeah? Uh-huh. Okay. Okay, no. I got it. So, so on biblical grounds, the 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 passage is taken badly out of context. I would argue. So then, uh, it's also flawed on theological grounds. Does anyone have any thoughts about that? Are you referring to God being um, angry with us and wanting to yeah. punish us? Yeah. 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 It's not like that at all. I think we bring this on to ourselves. Mm hmm. So we. Um, so the, this, the quotation that I read at the beginning is very much like Old Testament prophecy, right? Sounds very kind of Old Testament-like. So um, the Old Testament was replaced by the New Testament. Right. Well, not... not exactly replaced but i don't think it's no but it's a augmented i would say and, and some parts are superseded um but superseded is probably what i meant certainly to say. the yeah but the but the, so the the underlying you know, theology or the underlying uh you know sort of biblical hermeneutic of the punishing god is is really based on on the notion that 
every word of the Bible is literally true, that there's no contradiction. And, you know, in essence, that you can take any section, any selection from the Bible, and it has enduring validity, right? So you don't have to really struggle to define the relationship between Old and New Testament. You don't have to deal with contradictions in, in uh, mm -hmm. the Old and New Testaments because there supposedly are none. You don't really have to engage any of the issues. You can really just select your verse, and here they have Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. But so Old Testament prophecy, we, we've looked at this frequently, but let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, the very beginning of Hebrews. I'm sure that we've all read it probably 20 times together since it's one of my favorite passages. Hebrews. Chapter 1, verse 1. In many and various ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the ages. He reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature, upholding the universe by his word of power. So, we have prophets who speak, and we have the son who speaks. The prophets are men. The son is God. Men have a loss of fidelity. They don't hear the voice of God perfectly. Things get distorted. They don't know God directly. In contrast, the son, Hebrews says, bears the very stamp of his nature. And that very stamp of his nature is significant. It means that the son is in some sense a carbon copy of the father. The son is the same as the father. The son has the same authority as the father, but he also has the same image uh, as, as the father. So that's... Uh, a major difference between the prophets and, and the son. And so the author of Hebrews is saying that uh, there's a, a continuity here that throughout history, God always speaks. And there's a discontinuity that in the past, he spoke to the, son, the, the prophets, and now he speaks to the son a change. So then the question becomes, who is the son? And who is the father? How do we know the father? Well, most of the um, references, like, I don't know if it's that's correct, to be honest, but like the Old Testament, they refer to God a lot as the Father, right? Uh, not as Father, rarely. Uh, mm, okay. As Father, mostly by way of, of metaphor or symbol or analogy, for the most part. The only real, really hard references to God as Father in the Old Testament are God as the Father of David or the Davidic line. Mm. Uh, so most of the references are either to the Lord or, or to Yahweh. But so how do we know God? 
How do we know God the Father? Through the Son, no? Because the Son also the Son also refers like my Father, my Father, my Father. Right. We know God the Father through the Son. So that's uh, really critical. That's uh, Matthew makes that point very clearly, but John makes it even more clearly. Hmm. Look at John chapter 14, verse 9. Also, since Greg has joined us, I, I should add for you that we we were uh, planning to do Matthew's Gospel, our regular Bible study tonight, but we sort of got diverted. Uh, there was a there, there's a, a a post on the internet that's circulating very freely that basically says that God has inflicted the the uh, coronavirus on us for uh, whatever reason, and that. We uh, and, and then it quotes Second uh, Chronicles chapter seven verse fourteen that if we humble ourselves, etc., then uh, God will forgive our sins and will heal our land. There's a vision here of a punishing God who's eager to bring judgment and is eager to kill and to destroy. So I thought that it was really important that we. Uh, address that issue since um, a number of Catholics are are finding the argument very compelling, and I think that's very unfortunate. So, John chapter fourteen. Maybe we can start at eight. Philip said to him. John fourteen eight. Uh huh. Actually, let's start a little bit earlier. Okay. Let's start at seven. <laughs> so this is Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus says in verse seven, "If you had known me." You would have known my father also. Henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and we shall be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the father and the father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So whoever has seen me has seen the Father. There's a basic identity between God the Father and God the Son. They are one. There is only one God. So what is the character of that God? Remember we've... Uh, <clears throat> first of all, very loving. I'm sorry, what, Mary? I said, first of all, the part of his character is very loving. Right. Let's, um, about probably about two years ago, we studied the Beatitudes, right? Let's, yes. <laughs> let's turn to the Beatitudes. Chapter 5 of Matthew's Gospel, verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, so the mountain is a place of revelation. A mountain is a place for an epiphany 
a place where you encounter God. So Jesus goes up on the mountain and ordinarily, I mean, the, the, the imagery comes also from the Exodus event and, 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 uh, and Mount Sinai that Matthew is drawing on, but whereas Moses hears the voice of God, Jesus speaks because he is God. So there's a difference in who is on the mountain. Nevertheless, the mountain is a place of revelation. It's on the mountain that we come to know God. So seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we have poor in spirit, we have mourning, we have meekness, we have hungering and thirsting for righteousness, we have merciful, we have pure in heart, we have peacemakers, we have persecuted. So what are those? Because they're all contrary to human nature. By nature, we're not peacemakers, we're aggressors. By nature, we're not merciful. By nature, we don't hunger and thirst for righteousness. We like to look out for number one. By nature, we're not meek. By nature, we don't like to mourn. It's a sign of weakness. So what are all of those things? Those are all the natures of God. Those are all the attributes of God. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So going back to St. Gregory of Nyssa, there is only one, one beatitude. That beatitude is God. God himself is the beatitude. God himself is the blessing. And all of these things are merely attributes of God that when we take them on, allow us to imitate God and to imitate Christ. So that tends to frame who God is. If we also look at Jesus' ministry and his teaching, how did Jesus relate to a sinful world? <coughs> we like to see our own world as very sinful, and it certainly is. But Jesus lived in, in the Roman Empire in a time when it was also extremely decadent and extremely sinful. So how did Jesus relate to the sinfulness? Just drawing on St. Matthew's Gospel. Who are the greatest sinners of all? The tax collectors and the prostitutes. And <laughs> the tax collectors are the greatest sinners of all. They're worse there than the go. prostitutes. Oh, the yeah. With there you absolutely go. Absolutely no moral, no morality, no ethics. They're collaborators with mm -hmm. the enemy. They're betrayers of the Jewish people. You can't get much. They're much worse than the Romans who after all, are Romans. They're pagans. That's what they're supposed to be. 
And what did Jesus, how, how much condemnation did Jesus deal out to the tax collectors? Well, Matthew is one of his disciples. Right. He ate with them. Yep. He dined with them. That was one of the criticisms of Jesus. Prostitutes, similarly, he didn't condemn prostitutes. No, but um, Jesus is also, he's very loving and forgiving, but for those that came and repented. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not like all oh, tax collectors, you know, you're forgiven, but it's the ones that approached him and repented and wanted to follow him. Yeah, although we don't know, we really know, I mean, Matthew mentions that there were, the, the implication is that Matthew brought a group of tax collectors to dine with Jesus. It's not clear, you know, whether all of them repented, but, but the important thing is that Jesus generally didn't have condemnation. Jesus didn't have condemnation for the world. The, the important thing is that the world is supposed to be lost. I mean, it's not that the world is supposed to be lost. The world is lost, right? Without God, the world is lost. It's the responsibility of the church to bring people to a knowledge of God. It's not the responsibility of the world to save itself because the world is incapable of that task. That's what the church is for. And that's what the church is supposed to be doing. So in encounters, you notice that Jesus looked for praiseworthy elements, right? So with the centurion, he praises the centurion's faith. Because the centurion basically <clears throat> relates to Jesus as if he's a military For the Canaanite woman, remember, he heals her daughter after he, he, uh, he, um, he insults her because despite the insult, and unlike the Pharisees who feel offended and begin plotting against Jesus, the, the, the Canaanite woman instead simply digs in and continues to press for her daughter's healing and believes that Jesus can heal her. In contrast, those who are offended by Jesus believes he's the tool of Satan. So he looks for praiseworthy elements of people who um, you know, might otherwise be considered lost. I mean, he did seek out those that are lost, right? To bring them back to the Father. Right. Uh -huh. But those who didn't uh, want to acknowledge him, he left them alone. He wasn't like chasing, like, um, what should I say? He'd be like, if you don't want to believe, then that's up to you. Right, right. There's right. that free will, right? I mean, His ministry was aimed, directed at bringing people to, at, at presenting people with a stark choice, either before Jesus or reject him. Then let's um, also look at Matthew chapter 20. Verses 25 through 28. We haven't quite gotten there yet, but <laughs> we will one day. So this is um, <coughs> John and James's mother, whose name I forget, who is um, very likely, very likely John and James are Jesus' cousins. And her, their mother wants uh, her sons to have preferential seating 
in the kingdom of heaven. And uh, the, the disciples are scandalized by the idea. And uh, Jesus uh, resolves the conflict in, in chapter 20, verse 25. Matthew writes that, but Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must first be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus came not to, to uh, be served, but to serve and to sacrifice himself. And he calls us as well as a people of God to be a people of sacrifice. In fact, that's the, the significance of, of the Eucharist that we combine our sacrifice with the sacrifice of Christ, which is represented so that we can be transformed by God's grace and imitate Christ, represent, provide the image of Christ in a world that doesn't know Christ. So questions about that? Thoughts or comments? So we can look at some episodes where where um, there was either a desire for God's vengeance or there was an implication that God was uh, vengeful. So let's take a look at Luke chapter 13. And actually, one of those which we won't read was in our gospel reading from this past Sunday with the blind man in John's gospel. If you remember it, the, 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 uh, the disciples ask, ask uh, Jesus, why was this man born blind? Was it he who sinned or his parents who sinned? Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, neither. He was born blind to be healed by the glory of God. So the blindness was not his or his parents' fault. It wasn't anybody's fault. Similarly, in Luke chapter 4, this was a, in, after the fall of the World Trade Center, since this concerns a tower falling down. This was a, a major verse used by uh, evangelicals who opposed the um, evangelical interpretation of the punishing God. So it's Luke chapter 13, uh, starting at one. Did you say Luke four? No, Luke Verse Luke 13, four. chapter 13, it's verse 4. Oh, okay. Yeah. Actually, start at verse 1. There were some present at that very time who told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered thus? I tell you, no, 
but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 upon whom the, tile, uh, the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What Jesus is saying is that bad things happen, but they're not signs of judgment from God, but that we have to be prepared for the end and we have to recognize that we will be judged. And unless we turn to God, we will be, we will be stand condemned. But that's a different message than, than, than second, uh, than second, well, than this, uh, you know, this use of second chronicles, which uh, assumes that God is the motive force. God is the driving force behind the punishment. Jesus refutes that here. Uh -huh. And remember the description of um, Jesus' ministry in um, I thought it was chapter 10, but it's not. Oh, it's chapter 12. Of, of what? Matthew. I'll actually go back to chapter 10. In verse 7, there's Jesus commissioned to his disciples and preach as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without pay, give without pay. Take no gold, nor silver, nor copper in your belts. No bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals nor a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it, and stay with him until you depart. As you enter the house, salute it, and if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it shall be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. So if you're not received hospitably, you're not to retaliate, you're not to be angry, you're not to act out, you're to leave. And you're to trust that God will ultimately be the judge and God will deal with whatever injustice and wrong has been committed, but you don't want to compound the issue. Similarly, in chapter 12, um, Matthew applies to Jesus Isaiah's prophecy of the, the suffering servant in Isaiah chapter 42. Let's look at um, that in chapter 12 verse 15 Isaiah of no. Matthew. Matthew. Oh, Matthew Matthew yeah this is after another confrontation with the the Pharisees and uh, who are now plotting to destroy him 
on verse 15. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he, he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not wrangle or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets, nor will he, he will not break a bruised reed or quench a smoldering wick till he brings justice to victory, and in his name will the Gentiles hope. So no wrangling, no crying out, no breaking a bruised reed, no quenching a smoldering wick. Basically, non-resistance, don't make a lot of noise, don't publicize oneself excessively, simply focus on the works of God. So that's the ministry of Jesus. It's one of meekness, one of bringing hope, and in his name will the Gentiles hope, and not one of harsh judgment and of destruction. So that's Jesus. So the view here is that God comes to kill and destroy. Who does that? Not God. <laughs> The evil one. <laughs> the evil one. Satan. The evil one comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Look at John 10.10. 10. But Jesus, uh, starting at verse 7, Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not heed them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The thief here is an image of Satan, and he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So the view here is that God has, in terms of the coronavirus, has, uh, has uh, globally infected nearly half a million people brought about almost 19,000 deaths and that out of those nearly half a million people about 290,000 more than 290,000 have not yet recovered so some of those can be expected to die so so the view here is that god has caused the deaths of all of those people, which fundamentally means that God, if it's true, would be a murderer. But one of God's commandments is that thou shalt not kill. So this view basically presupposes that God can have one set of rules for himself and another set for everybody else, and he can do that because he's God but that's completely nonsensical. So this view of the punishing God is really a satanic one. It's one that confuses God and Satan and lifts up and, and worships Satan. It's a very serious form of idolatry. In fact, there is no more serious form of idolatry than worshiping Satan. So thoughts, comments about that? I 
I think a lot of this is people wanting to explain what they can't explain, what they're fearful of, and they're using the wrong means to do it. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it seems random, and they want to make sure randomness doesn't hit them. Uh huh. Right. And there's a there's a certain amount of self righteousness involved here, that uh, that uh, uh -huh. the worship of mammon, that the worship of athletes are somebody else's problems, that I somebody else's limitations, sins that I don't, I'm not involved in, so I'm safe. There's an implicit self-righteousness here. And, uh, and uh -huh. again, self-righteousness is only one pronouncing one's self-righteous, which usually means that one is not righteous. As Jesus frequently says, you have your reward. And he doesn't mean that in a charitable sense. Uh -huh. So the final problem with this is, is a historical one. The first is that it reeks of cultural chauvinism. You know that so God will heal our land and, and God is uh -huh. inflicting punishment on us because of worshiping athletes, worshiping musicians, worshiping actors, worshiping uh, money. But this is a global pandemic right, which has basically affected all of the nations of the earth. Many uh, American culture, despite its hegemony and despite the way in which it's spread throughout the world, nevertheless, does not yet completely dominate the world. There are still, particularly in the third world, many people who don't worship any of those things. In fact, uh -huh. have, they still have very limited exposure to those things. So it's, uh, it's both a, an, a, an enormously uh, culturally chauvinistic assumption, as well as in many ways, uh, in some sense, a very racist assumption, because it assumes that uh, simply others who are fundamentally innocent are being caught up in the carnage but they're marginalized, so who cares? The, the second problem here that's associated with healing our land is that this is rooted in the myth of the godly nation, that you know, somehow we're a nation under God, that we've uh, drifted away from God, and now we're being punished. And so there are typically two lines of, or points of demarcation or points of separation that, that evangelicals typically identify as separating us from God. The first is starting in 1962 the Supreme Court decisions that remove mandatory prayer from, from public school. And the second is Roe versus Wade and the legalization of abortion. The, uh, the, the public prayer and public school issue is, is an interesting one because uh, evangelicals have, I think, deliberately distorted the issue. In fact, prayer isn't illegal in public school, prayer, voluntary prayer initiated by students and student groups is permitted in public school, but mandatory prayer uh, dictated by the administration or you know, by the government, by the state is not permitted. <coughs> so prayer can still happen, but it has to be voluntary. So, um, but there's, so what about those, that dividing? What about the, the godly nation? 
Does anyone have any thoughts about that? So the, the, the call here is that we re should return to being a godly nation. Well, when the nation was established, we weren't very godly. We had, you know, taken land we that wasn't ours. We had slaves. All the issues that are still today, we had then. Right. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, exactly. The pilgrims who we idealize as being godly were anything but. I mean, they averaged like 4.3 lawsuits per adult against one another. They were contentious. They couldn't get along. They were the very non-image of godliness. The evangelical historian, uh, so-called evangelical historians have done, written a lot over the last couple of decades uh, attempting to show that the founding fathers were Christians and a couple were, but they do that by really distorting history. In fact, most of the founding fathers were deists. So that's basically the equivalent of the mod contemporary, um, uh, what is it called, the Unitarian Church, right? So they're non-Christian. Mm -hmm. Well, we can see that if we look at the Jefferson Bible, which is uh, consists of Jefferson's favorite passages from the New Testament with everything else, from the Gospels actually, with everything else torn out because he didn't like it. So the founding fathers were not Christian. And here again, evangelical, so-called evangelical historians uh, have really falsified history. And, and so this myth of the, if we, if we are to return to being a godly nation, that godly nation committed genocide against indigenous peoples. The number of Native Americans killed is unknown, but it almost certainly is possibly in the tens of millions. Slavery was defended by the church. There were no defenders of slavery outside of the church. White evangelicalism is noted for its profound racism. That continues to be the case today. If we return to being a godly nation, then, then that racism is an intrinsic part of, of white Christian culture. Our nation is the only nation in human history to have used nuclear weapons. We did it at a time that we refused to negotiate with the Japanese, that, that, uh, that, that the war was nearly over. We did it at a time that we wanted to prepare for the post-war period and particularly to control the Soviet Union and engage in nuclear blackmail to, to limit the influence of the Soviet, Soviet Union in the post-war period. So to accomplish that, we murdered wantonly about a quarter million people. So none of that is very godly. None of that is even remotely good. This, this myth is fundamentally destructive. And then the final thing about uh, history is that there's a certain short-sightedness. Well, there are two things. One, there's short-sightedness, and there is a model for how Christians should, should behave during pandemics. So pandemics have been very frequent throughout human history, and they've been very devastating. The, uh, there's, something called the plague of Cyprian. It's called the plague of Cyprian, not because it's from St. Cyprian of Carthage, not because uh, 
St. Cyprian caused it, but because uh, Carthage was, was particularly hard hit by the plague, not the plague, rather an epidemic, uh, probably of smallpox or a pandemic influenza, influenza uh, Carth Carthage was particularly hard hit at the time that St. Cyprian was bishop. And St. Cyprian responded with, with uh, enormous compassion and acts of mercy in caring for the sick. But in that plague, in that epidemic rather, about a million people died in Europe and North America. There's also a plague in 541 and 542 that killed about 100 million people. That was the, the first, probably the first uh, occurrence of the bubonic plague. Then in 1347 to 1351, there was another incidence of the bubonic plague that killed somewhere <coughs> between 75 to 200 million people, a good portion of uh, the population of Western Europe was killed and some parts of Western Europe didn't recover until the 19th century. So pandemics are not unknown. They're not, they're, they re occur routinely. And so the question is how do, who is responsible? How does this happen? And what do we do? So we can look at the examples of Christians and particularly of, of Saint Cyprian. So Saint Cyprian was really attacked for it, but he sold the resources of the church to assist the sick and the suffering. In his work on the mortality, Saint Cyprian made it clear where the plague came from or where the epidemic came from. This wasn't the plague. The plague came from the devil. Its only source is the evil one. So St. Cyprian was wise enough to know where it came from, but many Christians today aren't. They confuse the works of the evil one and the works of God. And then St. Cyprian also wrote about what we should do. And, and I want to read this from his work on the mortality. It disturbs some that this mortality is common to us with others. That's really the point you are making, Mary, that somehow I want to be exempt. And yet what is there in this world which is not common to us with others? so long as this flesh of ours still remains, according to the law of our first birth, common to us with them. So long as we are here in the world, we are associated with the human race in fleshly equality, but we are separated in spirit. Therefore, until this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal receive immortality, and the spirit lead us to God the Father. Whatsoever are the disadvantages of the flesh are common to us with the human race. Thus, when the earth is barren with an unproductive harvest, famine makes no distinction. Thus, when the invasion of an enemy, any city is taken, captivity at once desolates all. And when the serene clouds withhold the rain, the drought is like to fall. And when the jagged rocks rend the ship, the shipwreck is common without exception to all that sail in her. And the disease of the eyes and the attack of fevers and the feebleness of all the limbs is common to us with others. So long as this common flesh of ours is borne by us in the world. Moreover, if the Christian know and keep fast under what condition and what law he has believed, he will be aware that he must suffer more than others in the world, since he must struggle more with the attacks of the devil. Again, no question about where this is coming from. And further, beloved brethren, 
what is it? What a great thing is it? How pertinent, how necessary that that pestilence and plague, which seems horrible and deadly, searches out the righteousness of each one and examines the minds of the human race to see whether they who are in health tend the sick, whether relations affectionately love their kindred, whether masters pity their languishing servants, whether physicians do not forsake the beseeching patients, whether the fierce suppress their violence, whether the rapacious can quench the ever insatiable or ardor of their raging avarice, even by the fear of death, whether the haughty bend their neck, whether the wicked soften their boldness, whether when the, their dear ones perish, the rich even then bestow anything and give when they are to die without heirs. So the question isn't why has God inflicted this because he hasn't. The question is how are you going to respond and what are you going to do to help a suffering humanity? And so that's the question that St. Cyprian raised and that's the question that St. Cyprian himself personally um, addressed, addressed in a, both in the epidemic in Carthage as well as in his martyrdom in, in, a, in the persecution by, by Decian. So that's what's wrong with, with the, uh, the view that, that um, um, So that's what's wrong with the, the use of the Bible, with the theology, and, and with the history in this, what I think is really a, a, a satanic and, and fundamentally evil interpretation that confounds God and Satan and ultimately worships the works of Satan and worships Satan himself by Christians. So thoughts, comments, questions? I'm back uh, on us, you. rather than being worried about why it's happening. Right. Ron, thank you very much. The system seems like it works, and thanks for letting me sit in. I was going to beg out too. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for sitting in, Greg. Mm -hmm. So, any any comments, thoughts, questions? When so this this kind of thing happens you know, whenever there is some huge calamity, and, and particularly one that involves you know, a huge loss of life. It's almost with you know, a certain amount of glee that, that uh, the bodies are counted and, and you know, the head count is tallied to show that God is indeed active and at work in the world. So do we all feel that we uh, sort of have a handle on this so that we can you know, defend, encourage our fellows, brothers and sisters who uh, you know, find this compelling, or are, are you know likely to be trapped into believing it. And do can we you know, apologetically refute this position? Do we feel you know confident in doing that? More so than when the evening first began. That's for sure. Yeah, That's I good. That. <laughs> what, Colin? I said I second that. That's how I feel. You know, now we do have some uh, points of reference to uh, to discuss this, and not just say because that's you know <laughs> it's because of what I believe. You know, it's like you can go to references in the Bible and make these you know arguments. So. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, it, it's always really important to look at you know, the Bible verses that are being quoted and particularly to try to locate them within the context within which they occur, not only within the broader passage, but the meaning of that passage within the context of the whole Bible, particularly its relationship, the relationship of the Old and the New Testament, because those, those two are not equal. All things are not equal. All words of the Bible are not equal. There's no leveling mechanism in, in Catholic interpretation. Uh, so yeah. that's, you know, that's, that's really, really important. So it's when the Bible is used you know, sort of as a, a source, we should always view it critically and, and with a certain amount of suspicion to you know, ensure that the Bible is being used in a way in which our Catholic tradition insists that it must be used and it has to be used or else it becomes really meaningless even worse than meaningless words, words that become destructive mm -hmm. and that bring death instead of words that bring life. Yeah, you should write a paper on it. <laughs> you know, well, at least he's making a recording. That's what this recording yeah, is, Colin. But I was thinking it's just more <laughs> applicable in so many more ways than just the situation we're in, you know? Uh huh. That's true. Right. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. very true. I mean, we frequently attribute evil to God. We, yeah, we frequently attribute the works of the evil one to God, and uh, and then when it's done to people we don't like, we <laughs> are very happy about it. <laughs> It's it's very or when, or when we just feel self righteous about something and how we react to that, you know. Right. Right. Uh -huh. Self righteousness is always a sin. Uh huh. Yeah, or else even in false interpretation. I mean, it's easy to interpret it any way you want really right and so unless you have the proper grounds of trying to decipher from different angles it's really hard to just say well it's easy to say that god's not happy with us and and <laughs> this is how he's punishing us right right yeah yeah but you know, within the broader context of history, God sent His Son. Yeah. And well, I like the reference to the Beatitudes because that really does show us what kind of a God we have. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, and that it wasn't an angry, condemning Christ that was uh, proclaiming the gospel, you know. Right. Right, Christ's conflict was with the religious establishment. And, and they were, his conflict was with the religious establishment because they were supposed to represent God. The, you know, the the temple in Jerusalem was supposed to become the uh, the mecca which drew all of the nations of the earth, and and that never happened. There were very few proselytes. There were very few converts to Judaism. The pagan world remained the pagan world, and Jesus you know, really pointed to some major limitations of of the uh, the religious establishment the mm -hmm. leaven of the pharisees and the sadducees that that practically that they were practical atheists they did you know the ritualistic stuff they believed in the rituals but in some sense they didn't believe in the presence of god 
They didn't really believe that God was active and real. And they didn't believe that they were sent there to God is, separate everybody into good and bad piles, right? Right. Right. <clears throat> right. There are no good and bad piles. We're all in, the, fundamentally, we're all in the same bad pile. <laughs> right, exactly. I keep thinking about the prayer of uh, Pope St. Clement XII. Uh, God, I'm sorry for my sins. Deepen my sorrow. So we should begin in terms of sinfulness with thinking of our own and, and looking at our own and not at other people's and deepening our sorrow for where we've fallen short. That's uh -huh. a good place to begin because it allows us to connect with the sinfulness of others rather than, than to condemn the sinfulness of others. So ultimately, we end up assigning you know, sort of grades to sin. That person's an F sinner, but I'm an A sinner. I'm you know, much less, and so we become you know, like the uh, the Pharisee and the tax collector, where he's thanking God that he's not the, the tax collector. But the tax collector is repentant. <laughs> the tax collect collector is, he leaves justified. Mm -hmm. The Pharisee does not, because he's, in his opinion, a lesser sinner. Mm. But there are no lesser sinners. You are all in the same boat. Which is Cyprian's point. We're all in the same boat. We're all part of a struggling and suffering humanity. So what are you going to do about it? That's the test. Are there prayers? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll stop the recording. Okay. <laughs>